Welcome to Watches Live on Watchbox Reviews. All you who've joined me over the weekend, thank you so much. We had a record weekend for this channel. We have roared past 8 million views, and this channel started as a side project alongside Watchbox Studios, so thank you very much for making this dream come true. Tonight, we have an impressive array of high horology, and we may as well start out with the absolute best. The thumbnail watch. I promised, and now I deliver. Alanka und Zona. Zeitwerk. The original. This is the reference 140032 in rose gold. So a slightly different look. You can see not only is it an impressive double digital display, but it has hacking seconds. So I'm going to restart it right here and we're going to watch the full turnover. That's a monstrous watch right there. Digital display of time. When this thing bowed at SIHH 2009, it was a mind blower and it remains so. You have a mainspring that is partly anchored to the plates and bridges of the watch because it has so much force in it. You can see that there's a Maltese cross style stop works built in so that it will actually stop running when it no longer has enough energy to jump the discs. There is a time bridge internally that comprises a number of transfers and there are two third wheels with a hairspring between them and when this system unlocks and admits power to that first third wheel it's transferred to the hairspring that's the constant force device the buffer between the mainspring and the escapement so every minute power is transferred to the escapement through that remontoir. It's a circular remontoir, unlike the linear spring F. Pijorn uses, beaten away at a very traditional 18,000. This is also a gorgeous movement. You've got that constant force device, the big slow beating balance, the freehand engraving on two half bridges, the stop works, and then you turn it over and you realize that there is also a time bridge on the dial, as the display of hours and minutes is a single component incorporating a clear sapphire pivot jewel for the minute its discs. This is part of the movement, believe it or not. It's not the dial. It's actually a coded and finished part of the movement itself. The only disadvantage of this system is that you do have to wind it. It has a 36 hour power reserve, but I can't think of a more enjoyable daily interaction with a watch. Jumping straight into our live cast, let me acknowledge our guests. Simon Holt, first in the box from Hollywood, Northern Ireland. Tom P. Edward Ledden of Sweden. Matt Foster, hi guys. Sinvo, hi Tim, hi Sinvo, hail Bop, friend and a client, pilot style 123, Alexi Simola of Finland, Russell 996, watch doctor, I am Charlie, Mark S, Matt Foster, big fan of the Zeitwerk, I can see Arturo joining from Oz, and Abdul Rahman, thank you so much for joining me from Germany. I know a lot of these names, and where are you from? Claudio, down in the boutique, also in the box, answering your questions when I can't in live time during the whole chat. Now, let's talk about a watch that is about as distinct as you can get from Langa, and yet somehow part of the same high horology universe, or multiverse, to use the comic term. This is the Hublot MP6 Ayrton Senna. It has the Spirit of Big Bang case form, but it's part of the MP division, so MP or Masterpiece, the division created when Hublot bought BNB Concept back in 2010. That had been their supplier of high horology complications. They brought them in-house with Matthias Boutet in 2010, and now they make watches like this big, slow-beating tourbillon, this one with a 120-hour power reserve, and you'll note the image of the automotive slotted and cross-drilled brake rotor that doubles as the cover to the mainspring barrel. Of course, this is a tribute to the great Brazilian race car driver Ayrton Senna of Formula One, 41 pieces in honor of his 41 championships, and believe it or not, this monstrous thing is easy to wear as it's both cambered and composed of ultralight alloy. It is an F1 inspired timepiece after all. I'm generally not an Hublot guy, but between the ergonomics of this one, the complication, and the green accents, I have to admit this is one of my favorites. I'm going to throw it on the wrist and give you guys a wrist shot of this one. Other friends. Uh, Claudio, big fan of Senna, and I can see uh, Pilot Style 123 calling that a poor man's Richard Meal. I'll give you this. It may not be a Richard Meal, but this is where I'm going to stand up in its defense. This is all executed in-house. More often than not, when you see a Richard Mill, it is built by Dubois de Praz, Vauché, or Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papi. Hublot, to its credit, invested in the ability to build all of this in-house. 
and the masterpiece watches are something else. From the MP06 right here to the LaFerrari, they're special pieces, and Hublot may be known for its big bangs with ETA movements from the 2000s. They had to start the house on something. Building the foundation, this is now the apex of the roof, and it's an easy watch to wear. It's not even thick. It sits far lower on the wrist than an RM11. Sticking it to Richard Mill, this is Jean-Claude Biver's baby. Jumping back to the chat box right there, and I can see Watch Doctor saying actually looks sleek. It's surprisingly so, and again, it's got a curved case back. It actually sits better on my wrist than a big bang. And Blake Taylor joining in from Oklahoma. Welcome! Captain Zed is saying he's a fan. Let's talk about the IWC frankly, most folks don't even know about. Did you know there's a Portofino collection? IWC doesn't do a great job of publicizing it. And this is the most interesting of the Portofinos. Launched in 2016, this is the 5151 Portofino Mono Pusher Chronograph. You've got a lot going on here. Eight day manual wind chronograph caliber with a column wheel actuation and a mono pusher action. This is the biggest column wheel I've ever seen on a wristwatch. I might have seen bigger on a pocket watch at some point, but I'm not even certain. Big slow beating balance, eight day power reserve, overcoil hairspring, free sprung. It's a modern architecture, but the watch looks absolutely ancient. And that's because the first Portofino of the early 1980s was designed to evoke IWC's heritage as a pocket watch manufacturer. It was the giant Portofino. That was the 5152. This is the 5151 years later, but you can see the same aesthetic, that of essentially a pocket watch transformed into a wristwatch with welded on pastille style lugs. Minimalist anthracite dial, explosive sunburst qualities. You've got all the functionality of a calendar, a power reserve, and a long one with a mono pusher chrono. And I have to tell you that this is one of the chunkiest chronograph actions I have ever encountered. A wonderful piece from IWC and guess what? It exists. Right, jumping into the chat box right here from Alexi. He's asking, what is the young watchmaker who made a one hertz beating movement? Uh, the one hertz that I know of is going to be the Grunefeld one, so I'll have to look that one up myself. You stumped me. There you go. You don't win a prize, you win another display. And we're going to display a watch that is an interesting modern homage to a vintage timepiece that we've got on the table tonight. So this is an interesting piece because it's a 272 piece limited edition. Let me let me fix that because that's just too much. That's just a little bit too much finger oil right here. Fortunately, I work in a watch shop. I have many polishing cloths. And we'll go straight back to the Apollo 17th limited edition. This is a 2017 limited series. For the 45th anniversary of Apollo 17, you can see the GMT time that it left the surface of the moon, the last of the Apollos to depart, gold image of the god Apollo in the counter at nine o'clock, and the watch with a blue ceramic dial, blue ceramic tachymeter, full yellow gold case, and a case back with a medallion that is a combination of engraved white gold and yellow gold. This is downright baroque by the standards of Speedmaster limited editions. A watch that originally retailed for $20,000 and impressively actually sells about that pre-owned. So this is one of the rare solid gold omegas that's actually held up its value and remained desirable. With the Apollo 11 50th anniversary coming up next year, this might be one for the future. That said, I have one for the past on the table and it is the original Speedmaster Limited Edition. Not just the first Speedmaster Limited Edition, it's the first of the yellow gold Speedmaster moon watches. This is the BA145022, the moon watch solid gold commemorative for Apollo 11, part of a series of 1014 made in 1969. The first few went to US government and NASA dignitaries, and number one was actually engraved for the US president. That's at the Omega Museum today, but this one is in my hand and in our inventory. Not just a solid gold watch, a solid gold dial. If you've seen Sigma dials from this period, you'll see the little Greek letter Sigma signifying gold hands and indices. This one goes one better. With a solid gold, it's an or massif, OM dial, solid 18 karat yellow gold dial, vertically sat and grained. It has its original red anodized dot over 90 tachymeter bezel, and of course inside the Moonwatch caliber 861, but with Apollo 50 coming up, and this being one of the few survivors from that original run, many of them have been refinished down to nothing. This 
a third series case back. You can see it features all of its original red lacquering. We resolutely refuse to refinish this watch, even at owner request. So this timepiece is being sold in largely original condition. It has the signs of years on it, but that's how you know it's honest. And again, the original tack, those are usually replaced with black units when these are sent in for service. Onyx indices atop yellow gold bases with black hands for contrast. This is a stunning watch. Okay, and right here I have Dustin Van Patten asking for some more. By the way, guys, if you can help me out with that young watchmaker who created the One Hertz watch, I would love to know what that is. Jumping straight into something that's a little bit unconventional because it's simple and we've been showing complications all night long. Chichard Lecoultre in 1958 built a watch called the Geophysic. The E168 in its deluxe version, E169, was a 35 millimeter watch. And in 2014, JLC decided the time had come for a tribute to its most committed sports watch of the 1950s. This is the Tribute to Geophysic 1958 crosshair dial with quarter Arabics. My favorite detail here is evocative of the original, which features featured radium loom on the underside of the plexiglass crystal. Well here the loom is attached to the bezel for greater security, but you can actually see how the loomed dot in patina style Acru Luminova is anchored outboard of each applique hour index. Broadsword style hands, crosshair dial center, matte white. This part of a series of 800 pieces that were made in steel. They also came 300 in rose gold and 58 in platinum. Now the watch was surprisingly rugged. A 38.5 millimeter steel watch designed to evoke the original without being petite on the wrist. It's 100 meters water resistant. It features a soft iron inner cage to protect it from magnetism and is one of the most exacting regulations in the history of the master 1000 hours test through which JLC puts its watches. This one adjusted to no worse than minus one plus four seconds per day. A handsome timepiece and an absolute bombshell with one of JLC's best modern cases. It's vintage evocative, yes, but it's not a slavish tribute. This one actually has an identity of its own, and it's one of my favorite sleeper JLC sports watches. So from JLC, three hand, no comp, chronometry focused, we go to JLC high complication. I'm actually going to do a minute repeater showdown here. Two from Richemont, both in platinum. The first is going to be from JLC, and it's the master minute repeater Antoine Lecoult. Part of a series of 200 made in the year 2004. It was JLC's first round watch minute repeater, and easily its most vocal. A 15-day power reserve, manual wind, the entire movement in German silver. It features two complications, well, actually three on the dial side. Mainspring torque for the twin mainsprings, power reserve, the remaining days of operation, and you can actually just see the rack and snail, the strike barrel, and the strikers of the repeater on the dial side. On the case back, the movement entirely in un plated German silver, or Maishore, since we are in the French-speaking watch regions, the Valley du Jeu with Chagère Le Coult, nickel copper zinc, the copper giving it that golden hue, Côte de Soleil radiating out from the balance, a full balance bridge, this one beaten away at 21.6, and you can see the signature engraved and inked of Antoine Le Coult, founder of the manufacturer. The watch is sensational, and it is very loud. This one with a, I'm going to fire this one up and try to get it at 12.59 on the nose, but with potential of 70 decibels. Now that's impressive because it's a platinum watch. If you look very closely on the dial, you can see how they did that. JLC conducts the strike against the gong into the sapphire. There's a small welded heel with musical notes right around 530, and that welded heel physically attaches the gongs, which are rectangular in cross-section, to the sapphire. So the sapphire acts as the resonator, and it's clear, it's crisp, it's a ringing sustain. But I have a competitor from IWC. Now last week I showed you the IWC Grand Comp, the reference 3770, designed by Hanno Bercher, perpetual calendar by Kurt Claus, minute repeater by 
what was then Renault et Papi before Audemars Piguet got in on it, and it's all Schaffhausen. Well, I have a later example of the same reference, 3770, from the year 2000. It didn't change much between 1990 and 2010, but I'm going to let you hear how this watch sounds the exact same sequence that we just heard from the JLC, and what a difference that Sapphire Gong makes. Two minute repeaters in platinum, but a world of difference in the sound and the volume. Never let it be said that mechanical watch technology does not march onward, because that's the difference you'll hear between 1990, developed in the late 80s, and JLC's 21st century minute repeater. That is a world of difference. That said, the IWC is a grand complication, which means you get a moon phase. You get a fully coordinated, mechanically programmed perpetual calendar by Kurt Claus. You get a white lacquer dial. You get a platinum case. It's part of a series made in only 50 pieces per year for 20 years. This was number 50 of 54, the millennial model year. You get that perpetual calendar, the chronograph, the moon phase, and the minute repeater in a 42 millimeter case that wears surprisingly well. Now, this is a Santoni leather strap, the Italian leather house being IWC's preferred supplier today. And so we got this watch, we bought it, we brought it in, and we put it on a Santoni strap because, frankly, this watch deserves it. And it's an easy piece to wear. My wrist is small, 16 centimeters. This is a 42. Later on, the minute repeater, the chronograph, moon phase, and the perpetual calendar grand complication movement was fitted unchanged into a Portugieser case of over 44 millimeters diameter. I liked the original 42 right here. This is more my speed and my size. Jumping into the chat box right now, I think I can hear that, oh, Amro was asking, when is the Hublot? Sorry, we did the Hublot. Pop it up just for you, because you're a regular. Hublot MP06, 120 hour Ayrton Senna Torbion watch. 41 pieces in titanium, beautifully executed with the spirit of Big Bang case. This is from the 2014 model year. Don't you love those green accents? Jumping into, well, we, we did German watchmaking. We did a little bit of Swiss. Let's do some Japanese watchmaking and something that warms my heart because it is a simple and accessible watch on a table full of megabuck grand complications. This is the Grand Seiko SBGR261. Grand Seiko is a brand I love, but many of their watches are a little bit outlandish. This timepiece is as classical as they come. 39.5 millimeters in Zeratsu polished, basically optically smooth, hand-finished stainless steel. The watch is designed to evoke the Grand Seiko timepieces of the early 1960s. So a little bit of a back to the future play. You can see how the box section sapphire evokes a plexiglass and how there is a distinct break between the case band and the lugs, just as it was during the 1960s when a case would be assembled from components and then welded together. But the fit and finish of this one quite a bit higher. A cream or ivory lacquer dial with all applique indices. The indices are diamond polished and then applied by hand with a similar level of finish applied to the Dauphine style hands at center. These are both faceted and black polished with extraordinary calib character and luster. The seconds hand, True heat blued steel, not chemically dyed. Turn it all over, adjusted in six positions. This is a Grand Seiko automatic with a three-day power reserve, 35 joules, hacking seconds, quick set date, and absolutely nothing given up to Swiss watchmaking. Whereas a Swiss chronometer is generally adjusted in five positions, this one is adjusted in six. Whereas a Swiss chronometer is generally timed for 14 days, this one is timed and tested for 17, going above and beyond with a very wearable watch. This is a timepiece with a classical good look. A wonderful halfway between something like a 36 millimeter Rolex Datejust and a Datejust 41. I find that this watch surpasses the pulchritude and appeal of both. And full deploying clasp. But I will admit Germany does a pretty good job. Jumping back to Longa, a brand I love dearly, this is a different kind of constant force device. This is the 2009 Alanka und Zona Richard Longa Pour Le Merit. Now, if you know what the Pour Le Merit series is about, you know that this watch has a chain and fusée. What you can't see from the front through this enamel dial is the caliber L44. 
915 pieces in this movement, of which 636 are in the 1.5 meter long fusée chain. So the system works like bicycle gears. You have a, you have the crank and you have the cassette on the back. And as you run out of steam in your legs, you use a bigger and bigger gear. And that's exactly how this system works. You can see that it has a stop work. So as soon as I start winding, there's already energy in the system to start it up. But you can see how the chain moves from one to the other as I wind it. That tiny chain with its one quarter of a millimeter thick individual links is the link between the barrel and the fusée. And the fusée is gradiated like a spiral. So the chain climbs up and up and up. So it's effectively turning a bigger and bigger gear. As the mainspring barrel winds down and loses its energy and its force, the fusée and chain provides a constant force device, much like the Remontoir in the Zeitwerk. They're two entirely different systems. This one more of the wristwatch era, the Remontoir. This one more of the pocket watch era, the fusée and chain. Both beautiful. What sets this watch apart is that you get that fusée and chain. And by the way, that one millimeter thick chain can hold up two kilograms of mass hanging freely. Let's see if we can pull this back and get it in more focus. Get it in a sharper resolution. Perfect. You can see the engine turning on the balance bridge, on the base plate. Different size engine turning, freehand engraving, glasuta stripes. And of course, that German silver, nickel, copper, zinc, untreated alloy with its golden hue. I'll turn the fusée and chain one more time so you can see the chain moving across. It's, it's right in here. But for the most part, what you're going to see is the Grand Faux enamel dial. Now, there's a couple of colors here. You have that rich Grand Faux white. You have the black of the individual Roman numerals, but then you have a few red accents at the quarters. I appreciate that, along with the blued alpha style hands at center. 200 pieces made in rose gold that year, 50 pieces in platinum. This is a sensational timepiece front and back, but it's one of the mightiest three hand watches and one of the most complicated you will ever encounter. Throw this one on the wrist. You can see it's easy to wear. Okay. Now let's jump from, we went from Switzerland to Japan and to Germany, back to Switzerland, back to Germany. Let's talk about another watch that's fairly accessible among our cadre of elites. This is the 2016 version of the Omega C Master Planet Ocean. And in this 2018, we're talking about the 25th anniversary of the Diver 300 meter. Don't forget that there is a 39.5 millimeter Planet Ocean that is a totally legitimate, traditionally sized dive watch. The Rolex sub is only a 40. This is the mid-sized Planet Ocean, only 14.4 millimeters thick against 13.7 for the new Diver 300. This is a watch you can absolutely wear with a cuff. It's not oversized like the other Planet Oceans, but what it does have is all of the refinement. About 40 millimeters at 39.5. The watch is easy to wear across the wrist because the pivoted end links of the bracelet allow you to pull it straight down. So you don't have that flare of a solid end link that you get on older planet oceans. The result is that this watch is less than 46 millimeters lug to lug. Now I talked about refinements that are germane to the planet oceans and here they are. White gold numerals, hands and indices, ceramic dial base, and a ceramic bezel insert. You get all of these on this watch plus a coaxial master chronometer, METAS certified with a 55 hour power reserve. This is a lot of content for a timepiece that's often overlooked because it's a midsize. Midsize is not an epithet. This is a watch that anyone can wear daily with a suit, and I can't say that of the larger Planet Oceans. For me, this would be the no-brainer choice from among the entire collection, and I would also say this is the only Omega dive watch anyone needs because it can do it all. Still 600 meters water resistant, still with the helium escape valve, and the helium escape valve can now be opened underwater if you're following up on my Monday show and planning to dive the Andrea Doria. We did talk about diving the Andrea Doria yesterday. If you haven't seen my Monday show, you want to watch that. Shipwrecks, Titanic steel, drug running, it's all there. Jumping back, I can see right here, Steve Bowden saying, I like the orange tip of the seconds hand. I also want to remind you guys, Claudio is in the chat box. He's in our boutique downstairs. He has access to all of these watches. So he's in the chat box answering questions as I chat away. Bump, 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 bump. And I can see 
JBO Surf opining that Longa is the best finishing in the business at the moment. And Abdul is saying Alanka and Zona are on a class of their own in movements and more beautiful even than the dial. And that's saying something on a Grand Faux. Right now, pre-owned Longa is the best buy in true high horology. Handmade watches, hand-finished watches, no more than 5,000 pieces a year. For whatever reason, that's too much for the market, so prices are soft. But you know what? They're objectively rare. For every 100 Rolex Submariners you see, I don't know if you'll see even one Longa. And for every 20 Patek Philippe's you see, I don't know if you'll see one Longa. So consider that exclusivity and the quality of what you're getting. Don't look at it as an investment. Bonds are an investment. Real estate is an investment. T-bills, those are investments. Buy yourself some German Bunds. Those are definitely investments. But here's the bottom line. If you want an experience, you go on a vacation, you don't expect resale value. You buy a purebred dog to enjoy, you don't expect resale value. A year of dining at fine restaurants, what's the resale value of a meal? A belch? I don't know. But I can tell you that the watch will endure and remain, and it'll never be worth zero. Emotionally, it'll be worth quite a bit more. Patek Philippe, we mentioned them. Why don't we jump into the most beloved travel time watch in the Patek catalog. This is the Patek Philippe Aquanaut Travel Time. Launched in 2011, this quickly became the travel time Patek, even though it's by no means their first. The watch is beautifully executed. It's about a 41. It's a 40.8 in red gold with a brown bronze dial that definitely has a gradient from lighter at the center, darker at the edge. It's the integration of the travel time complication into the flank of the watch that makes it almost seamless. You can easily cover up that GMT hand when you don't want it. And the watch, 120 meters water resistant, still gives you everything an Aquanaut gives you, right down to the composite strap in brown, and probably the best class Patek Philippe makes on a bracelet or strap. This is actually more substantial than the clasp on a bracelet clad Nautilus. People always ask me, Tim, what's the difference between an Aquanaut and a Nautilus other than the price? Two things. One, the case construction. It's more complicated on the Nautilus. That does add cost. But more substantively, when you're looking at the watch, you're feeling the aesthetics. What makes it look different? The Aquanaut has lugs and the 70s child Nautilus does not. And the lugs of the Aquanaut give it greater strength, more of a masculine, hard-edged character than you get on the integrated and somewhat monolithic Nautilus. This is simply a stronger looking watch with a little bit more attitude, a more youthful ambiance, and clad in the strap, a completely different character. This is definitely a child of the modern era, whereas the Nautilus is beginning to look a little bit like a vintage trip. So if you want the most expressive Patek Philippe sports watch, look no farther. Aquanaut Travel Time in red gold. Do I have anything else left on the table? Yes, I have one more bombshell from our friends out of the Far East. This is a watch I have yet to encounter in the United States, and I believe it to be a Japanese domestic market, or at least East Asian market exclusive. Part of the 9F 25th Anniversary Series, this is the SBGN 007. 007 an interesting appellation as the watch features both the 007 code and a British racing green dial with the recurring international symbol of quartz as used across watchmaking. Now the watch is a hot rod. It's a 9F caliber, 25 years young for 2018. This is a 1200 piece steel limited edition 40 millimeters. But that 9F thermocompensated watchmaker adjusted watchmaker built movement has a hand selected quartz oscillator that makes this one accurate to plus or minus five seconds per day. That is the most accurate watch, mechanical or electronic, you will ever encounter. It's not being fed its lines by a radio or an atomic clock someplace. It can actually maintain five seconds per year. A chronometer can get a certificate at five seconds per day. And this one is a GMT. This would probably be my pick. Of what's on the table tonight, it's probably the tribute to Geophysic, the Richard Longa Pour Le Merite, or this. All different watches, completely different aesthetics, completely different vibes, different watches for different moods. That's watch collecting. And, friends, that's our show. In the box, if you're watching this, let me know how I did. Enter to win our Tudor Black Rose, the Black Bay Black 7922N. We are giving away the rarest modern Tudor for the month of November, but the month of November is almost over. So enter to win, and remember, when these lights go down, the fun continues on Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. That's right, I have a second life on the short video format. 
Guys, thank you for joining me from around the world. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew, and if she's watching, thanks to my mom. All of you guys have made this stream possible. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.